Fatujalo, aka Tufa. Yeah. Thank you very much um, for this opportunity. Right. And um, welcome to the Chronicle. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So let's start from first right. as a, an 18 year old in the Gambia growing up. Right. And um, you took part in a beauty pageant in the country. What were your dreams at the time? Um, thank you for being here. I, 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 I've always been a theater person, you know, um, loved stage performances, debates, drama, whatever that is, ever ready to represent uh, the school or the drama club. So I, I had a huge passion for theater and presenting ideas in, um, in action. So I always thought at the time that I would definitely be in Hollywood or Nollywood. Nollywood to be specific because that's that's what we um, that we that's what we have watched more frequent. And going into the pageant it, it wasn't really planned for a while. I have watched it on national TV for previous years leading up to before I participated. And all I've seen is really great, brilliant young women who were going to university, college and other institutions who participated and sought a lot of, you know, a lot of talent in order to have a scholarship to go study abroad, which, which really is a noble thing to do. And if you can use your talent as a young lady to get you that further in life, I thought that was really awesome. And I loved the idea of being on it someday. So I found myself participating in it when I was, um, when I just started college from graduating from New Street School and uh, the first day it was a few girls that approached me jokingly saying oh you should represent the Gambia College you're beautiful and you know all of those jokes I said that's fine you can put in my name so they did so I didn't take it that serious because I didn't go home and tell my mom and my mom is very used to me just jumping into competitions and dramas that it has gotten to a point I don't really tell her until the day or the day before so they put in my name. I missed a few rehearsals until I met them again and they told me, we have not been seeing you for rehearsals, you know. And um, I said, oh, great. And I, I followed them and there was rehearsals happening. And I remember that day they were having like um, rehearsing catwalk, how to catwalk inside a classroom at the Gambia College. So I joined in and we had a couple of rehearsals and we were supposed to have a preliminary round inside the college where the School of Education, School of Nursing, Agriculture. We will all compete, but the first runner-up and the second runner-up will then represent the college as a whole at the national level. So that's that's how I found myself participating in the pageant. Mm. Yeah. And, um, so through that, one thing led to the other, um, and then it led to you meeting former President Yaya Jame. Right. Um, can you tell me your first encounter with him, the first time you met him? Um, the first time we met him was an unofficial meeting and it was me with the rest of the girls. He was being awarded with a um, food self-sufficiency certificate and I remember coming in late because I was supposed to suit for a scene in a movie but I had to come because as the winner I have to be at the official events. So I remember coming in there and then after the the whole celebration and certificates were given, we were told that he's going to pray and then we were taken into office to wait for him. So all of us and then later on that time we did meet him for the first time. This is the first time I'm seeing the president up close or personally, you know, in my life. I have never been the enthusiastic political 18 year old or teenager in the Gambia. As I said, I wasn't following or even knew what was what. I, I really was just doing theater and drama. So we met him for the first time and again he was making jokes like he normally does you know fullers and jollers and cereals and, and all of that really being you know the nice persona as seen on tv as Wh well which year was this this was now the competition happened in 2014 and then we met him in 2015 the beginning of it mm. so if your question is when did i personally meet him mm. that was after the the official meeting has already happened so there's a platform that we give when we are doing the competition so mine was on poverty alleviation so you had to promise something you were going to do after you win before you go to study my platform was on poverty alleviation so i had to do a little project around it provide um, 
a proposal for what I want to do and a budget will be given to me. But again, going into the competition and I'm so with most of the girls, you know, the thought process at the time was the, the Ministry of Education is responsible for the paperwork of both the scholarship and the platform and stuff. So I was home, I have gone back to college, I was going back and, and fro from college, leaving my normal life as I have been doing. And then I received a call from Jim Bijame, who is a protocol officer and a cousin to the president at mm -hmm. State House. And you know... Who's currently with him in the Equatorial Guinea. I'm sure yeah. he sees with him in the Equatorial Guinea. Yeah. yeah, great. So she called me and you know she said how are you you know you know how are you doing and she extended regards to me she didn't speak to me in um, like a formal or an elderly person it was like a girl and a girl speaking mm -hmm. more on the grounds of hey jaha nangadef and, and all of that so she then told me how far have you gone with your project and uh, at the time, I haven't really started. So I, so I told her that I haven't really started. You know, I'm just putting something together, the idea of what I want to do. And she said, oh, hurry up and put it together. You know, I can help you get it to us here at State House. So I asked her at the time, oh, am I not supposed to take it to the Ministry of Education? And she said to me, yeah, you could, but that's like a longer bureaucracy for you. If you take it to the Ministry of Education, or to the Ministry of Education, so he's gonna bring it to the office and I have to show it to the president. So that is the routine. So I'm giving you a faster route to just bring it to us and that way you don't have to go through all of that. Yeah. So that's what she told me. I said, fine, I'll get back to you. So I haven't, but I remember reaching out to a few friends that I wanted to draft um, um, a proposal for what I wanted to do at the time. Uh, a few weeks later, she called me back and said, um, oh, we, we haven't really heard back from you, you know, how far with the proposal. Mm. So I told her at this point, I have got a draft. It's, it's nothing really serious. It's just the idea of what I want to do. I have left most of the paperwork with my friends anyways, but I can draft the idea and the setup I want to do on it. She said, okay, then I'm going to send a car to come and get you so you can bring the proposal. So this was the first time um, that she invited me to come over, but solely on the basis of my project again. And that was at State House? That the invitation was to State House. Okay. So a car came, picked me up, took me all the way to Banjul. We passed through the first gate and there's a garden on the right. That's where all the events happen. And then there's a second gate, which leads to the residency of the president. So when I got off the car on the stairs, Jimbi was standing there and she hugged me and said, hi, how are you? I said, I'm fine. And this was in the evening around 5 p.m. I got off, I walked in with her. We passed a few big sitting rooms, living rooms. And then uh, we went upstairs and then there was a personal bodyguard to the president called Kim Papa. And he took my bag and my phone for security reasons, I guess. So we went into a bigger living room and we were sitting there and we were supposed to wait. So we were sitting there and waiting. Mind you, at this time, when she has been saying, we, 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 I really didn't think it was just her and the president. Mm -hmm. I thought that maybe the state house have a group of people mm -hmm. that work on the scholarship package and the paperwork and all of it. And I'm supposed to meet with those people. I didn't know that we was just her and the president at the time when I got in there. So I took, a, I took a seat and she took a seat too and we were there and the TV was on. I can remember clearly it was Animal Planet. And we were there for an hour and a half waiting, you know, and she kept saying, oh, the president is praying, he's praying, but he's gonna come, come soon. So as we were there, time went by, the president walked into the room. Um, he had just the last, um, a buyer that you have on the, the half tan because it's like the Nyetingaran boob, so the last part of the Nyetingaran boob, and he did not have a hat on. So for me, the first time I saw him, you know, the normal crazy, uh, crazy thoughts of a teenager is, oh, he looks different than he does on TV. You know, his head is pouched in, you know, those were my thoughts, like, he looks smaller, does he add bigger things to get big on TV? Of course, he was in carrying the beads and then the, the Quran that he... No, there, there was no Quran in the hand, so it was different, and all my life growing up, that is the image I have seen, so for the first time, here is an image I have not seen before. 
I so he said hi I, and I got up and I, I shaked my I pulled my hand out to shake his hand and then he shaked my hand but then hugged me nothing you know out of the way just a fatherly hug and he said hi the fuller has invaded again with the normal fuller jokes mm -hmm. because he's a jola that he's gonna kidnap me that he owns fullers and th those were the jokes so he came and um he sat there next to me but on this other couch jimby was still sitting on this other couch a little bit tilted back on the couch and so i sat down and he was asking me you know you know and he said to me you know i watched your competition I said, yeah, I, I assume at this point he was like, that's great. So he asked me where did I learn to play the Riti because I played the Riti in my talent display. And I told him that I learned it a few weeks leading up to the competition because I wanted to use it. He's like, oh, that's brilliant. It was different. You know, you, everything, both your, your, your platform and your talent. So he commented all of that and he, he was telling me that this is a great opportunity to study you know to be all that you want to be i can see you're a very you know talented young lady you can do so much for this country so i don't expect that you're going to just go and and get married or you know start hanky panking around same normal daddy mm. advices and then from that he kept on talk he went into talking about his own childhood you know how he really was underestimated, you know, about his dad and his uncle stories, you know, and stories. I think as many people nothing, know of him. Nothing that scared you. Nothing that because scared even me. Even at that time, there was a lot of reports, a lot of, you know, speculations, right. a lot of, you know, right. statements about how right. brutal and treacherous Great. he was. Yeah, but the statements that I wasn't exposed to statements that a lot of teenage girls in Gambia are not exposed to at the time. Most of the conversations that were happening about whatever Jamme did was outside of the country. And in order to access it, you have to have special interests to go and search for either the Fatu Network or Freedom Radio to sneak around to look at that. It wasn't conversations we were having in our home. You don't wake up and hear your mom and your dad talking about someone who's been brutally murdered or brutally exiled or you, you don't hear that so you have when we have you hardly buy credit you don't you don't have money for credit and when you get credit you will rather go and post a picture in facebook mm. is the reality of the teenage you know the, the, the teenage girl in gambia trying to get credit right. or go and look at who bnc is dating or rihanna mm. right. so, so until you, you are politically savvy or from that family who has been affected you know it's not something that comes across like right. today you know we do so at the time sitting there i, I wasn't feeling threatened or scared for my life because I, I wasn't privy to information that would make me scared at the time mm. so and what, what happened after his advice after his marathon advice then he decided to look at my project <laughs> you know then he decided to look at my project and he said oh this is a great idea i would just like you to involve the province areas because i haven't put a lot of those and he was saying we cannot forget those people i cannot just organize drama competitions for the combo area i have to include the, the provinces as well so he told me to change that and then let him know and that was it he said good night and he left the room before we left and then i left the room i got into the car and the car dropped me back home so nothing really crazy so after that um first meeting then we had another official meeting so if i say official it means all the girls together yeah, not right. personal mm. so we were going for there were so many events that we went for so whether it was um whiskey when he came whether it was the president being awarded whether it was the 50th independence anniversary which happened in february of 2015 we went to canin Lai, we went to the stadium as a group we had asobis that we sewn and we were wearing mm. so the first time i felt like something was off just even in the slightest was in a public gathering that we went to in banjul in, in the makati square and when the president came down and our group was standing up he he was saying hi to the group but he pretended to distance himself not to know me so it was more like hey um no this all the other last names and when he got to me he was like um what's your name again so there was a sense of deliberate attempt in public not to how did you feel suspicious no i just felt something was off because i i, I remembered oh a few weeks ago 
I met you personally and we discussed my project and you were explaining your childhood to me but all of a sudden you don't know my name anymore so I felt something was off in hindsight now I am saying it's a deliberate attempt to make so no one else even thinks that he knows me mm. in hindsight in the moment I just felt something wasn't right but whatever mm. so all this events were happening on the outside these big events that we would go to but in the next private meeting again was the same Jimbi Jambe calling me and telling me did you make the edit that we tell you have you have a better draft to your project mm -hmm. I said yes so she called the driver to bring me again for that same project to the same place to the else. same place again and the but same in a routine at the same routine different living room same thing happened again this time around he said it was okay so now i should go and work on the budgeting how much money would i need to carry out this project nothing happened it, there was no sense of you know that this is what he wants to do it was building trust that i could trust him as a father that i could trust him as an ally and someone who's just helping me to do something better and do it bigger so I was grateful for that. So I went home. Again, we were having meeting gatherings in between there. But someday again, Jimby calls me that he wants to come and visit my family because he hasn't formally uh, met them. And the president would like to formally congratulate them. So she's coming on behalf of the president. She came to my home. My mom just bought her, she bought her home six months before or a year no two two years two years or more before but we haven't had running water in the home yet so when jimmy came she got off my dad was there my mom and she said hi to them i am jimmy jame i work at the state house you know and i'm just here to say that you have an awesome daughter you know you know she's amazing we are glad that she's the winner this year and we think she's gonna do great things we expect her to come back and serve the country and all of that so they sent pleasantries, where are you from in the Gambia, the normal Gambian conversation. As soon as he stepped out, Jimbi saw my brother carrying bottles of um, water from the tap. Mm -hmm. And she asked, oh, you don't have a tap? I said, we have applied with Nawek, but not yet. So Jimbi went to the corner on her phone. She called the president or the president called her, I don't know, but she was on the phone all of a sudden. It was like, yes, sir, yes, sir, excellency, yes, sir, excellency. And then she told me to answer to the phone. So I picked up the phone and it was him. It Again, was it was Jamme on the phone. Mm -hmm. And he said, hello, Fulagal. Oh, the Jolas have taken over your home today. Made a few jokes as usual. And she, told, she tells me that you don't have water in your home, you know? I said, no, we haven't yet. They haven't taken our application. She said, okay, we will settle that. That's all he, sa he says and uh, hangs up the phone and great. Then Jimby went back home and two weeks later, there was Nawek at the home digging up and they brought in water. The next day, Jimby calls in and brought furniture at the house, mm -hmm. calls me that she's bringing furniture, that I should come to get furniture. She bought um, a closet and a table and a chair because it's a newly built home and brought furniture to the home. And I remember my mom asking, oh, is this part of the package of winning? And she said, oh, yeah, every winner gets something different. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they get gifts. It depends. And my mom said, OK. And that happened, was done with. And then I got invited again. Now, this day was for the budgeting. So I came in with my budget, what I thought I would need for the project. The same state house. The same state house, the same residence. This time around, he was... Um, he, organ he was having dinner, so just him. Before we got there, his chef has brought fish and goat and all these things. And it was a humongous table, as if the whole village was coming to have dinner, but it was his dinner night. And he told me to come and have a seat and eat. So me, him and Jimby were sitting around the table. And I can remember that year, I think Mosen was wrestling with Balagado and you know, in Senegal. In Senegal. Mm. So the, there was a conversation around who's going to beat who, who he thinks, you know, is more powerful. So he was so much in, into that. After having the dinner, he offered me, offered me to be a protocol officer if I would want to a work job. a job, if I would want to be a protocol officer at the state house. 
And uh, at this point, I told him I couldn't. I'm a, if you know me, my mom knows I'm a very clumsy person. Paperwork is not something I can do. And I just finished high school. I had no experience to work at the state house. And I know it was going to be a mess. I was going to mess things up. Mm -hmm. So I told him that I would rather go and study and get some experience. And I wouldn't mind coming to serve the country at that time. But in the moment, I, I couldn't. You know, and in that moment, I could see the suck in his face as to why would you reject such an opportunity? So he shaked his head. He's like, you, you feel a gal, yeah. you know? He's like, but that's fair enough. So that was the first proposal for me to come and work here, there. The next one was him telling me, you know, I would like to marry you. Right, so my, my eyes opened ten times wider. That was, that was the same night when the you same, had the Yeah, the same night that we and have that was the in day. front of Jimby. Jimby was there. Jimby is always there, mm. you know. Mm. Jimby is always there. Did you take it seriously when, when he proposed he asked for to marry you? No. In that second, I'm like, is this a test? Because all this while he's been telling me not to marry, mm -hmm. to go and study. I'm like, is this a test? You know, is he trying to taste, you know, to see what my, my, my level. So in that very split second, when I heard it, that that's what came to my mind. And then I looked at him and he was still looking at me as if he was dead serious. I said, oh, no, you know, and he was like, why? You know, and I said, first, because you're like a father to me and that's the relationship we have built your daughter is 16 or 17 i don't know around that age and i am almost four or three years apart from her secondly i do not want to get married right now whether it's to you or to any other person it's not what is on my list right now you know so he's he looked at me and he said oh maybe you haven't heard what i say i will let you go home and think about it because he, he's thinking the reason why I'm saying no is because maybe I do not understand what yeah. he is saying yeah. and what he's saying to me is such a big deal that somehow I was supposed to jump at the opportunity because he is the president yeah. and I think that has been what really hurt Yaya Jamba throughout the process is the fact that I've always found I was so naive and at the fact that I could just tell him no you know I could just turn down things I think yeah. he could not understand or he wasn't used to that idea. So I can always see it setting him aback and he is not able to say many words. Mm -hmm. And so, he asked you to go home and think about it. To think about it. And you left. Yeah, and I left and, and nothing happened. But when I, when I got home that night, I was like, oh, he was actually serious about that? That's, that's insane, you know, that's crazy. And to me in that moment was, okay, first of all, no one is gonna believe that the president wants to marry you. So maybe it was just a test, let it go. It didn't happen. Block Jimby off of your phone. Go about your business. Go to school and my. Again, to show you how I do not understand the gravitas of Yaya Jame, thinking that I could just block everyone or him and just go to school, you know? Thinking about it now is insane, mm. knowing what I know and that at the time I thought I could just move on like a normal day and nothing happened. So I decided to do that, but Jimby uses a private number, um, no caller ID, so he can call you from any number and any time. So a few weeks after that, she called me again, Jimby, and she told me that she wanted to sell me something. So she took me to the AU villas that you have yeah. uh, in Karabakh and sold me one of them and sold me a car in it. And she told me this is going to be yours, you know, after we tie the marriage. And I told her, okay. If this is mine, like it's being given to me now, I appreciate that. That's fine. But if it is under condition of getting married, I don't want it. You know, I meant what I said that day and I still mean it. There's nothing to even think about it. I really don't want it. I, I, that's not what I want. So that was the first day Jimby actually spoke to me regarding it. So that. she said to me, what is wrong with you? You know, do you know how many girls will jump at this opportunity? You know, so she was pissed at me and then she told me, let's get in the car. I got, she got into one car, headed back to Banjul, and one of the cars dropped me at home. Mm. And when, when next did you meet? When next yeah. I met was, before that, Jimmy called me again to, to come to some event, whatever was happening, or to, 
and because now I've already sworn him my budget, I have already sworn him my proposal, there is no, no conversation about the project anymore. I, I found no reason to go back to the state house. But she called me and she invited me to something I really can't remember. And because I didn't want to go, I told her that I was having stomach ache and cramps and I wasn't feeling well, which I was lying because I didn't want to go. And then she told me she would get me a doctor to take me to the hospital for checkup which I went and did, but nothing was wrong with me and, you know, gave me prestamol and medication they, that I have flu and all that. So I came back home. The next time Jimby actually calls me now, and in between this, there's so many, you know, major events that happen with the team and with the group and going to Canning Line, but we are talking about the personal meetings. Yeah. The next one was June of um, 2015, before the Ramadan. It was around um, 7 or 6 in the evening. Jimby called me and told me that there's a Quran recitation at the state house and I should be there. And I asked her where are the other girls and she said, oh, they have already gone. You were late, but I will get a car to come and get you to come. So I wore my dress. I wore leggings under my dress and I had um, uh, a veil because it's a Quran recitation event. Went to Banjul. First gate opens again um, in a tinted car, and as soon as we got in, uh, Jimby told us that the president is coming to take a seat, and normally when that is happening, the cars are not allowed to move and people are not allowed to move around. You have to stay in the corner until the president takes his seat for security reasons before you can move around. So she told me to take a seat in an office and wait until the president takes a seat. So I went into that office with her and I sat down, and she said to me, oh, it's been a while. You've been avoiding my calls. Are you fine? Are you OK? And I told her, yes, I'm, I'm completely fine and I'm OK. She said, that's good, that's good. You're feeling better now? I said, I am. And as we were sitting there, she came, went out for whatever, came back in and told me, let's move to the next room because some officials are coming to have a meeting in that room, so we mm -hmm. should move to the next one. So we moved to the next room. And we were there and she decided to, that she wanted to go get water for us and if I wanted water. So she left to go get water. And as I was sitting there out of nowhere, Yaya Jamme walks into that same room, you know. And when I saw him, the first thing in my head is, oh, I, I thought he was supposed to take a seat. That's why I'm here in the first place. But when he entered again, he had his, um, on the, on the clothing and no hat again. He did not look like he's about to leave that room for the event. And the, and the crowd, the guests were all there. They were outside mm. and they were doing all this sukula mm. and recitations and you can hear it loud and clear from mm. where I was sitting. So it was very pretty loud. You know how the gamos go. So, so when he walked in for the first time, he wasn't you know, the Yaya Jame I have met or seen or discussed project or childhood stories with. It was Yaya Jame with very red, big eyes and there was such rage and anger in his face. And he walked up to me and his first thing that comes up to, out of his mouth is, who do you think you are, you know? Just so, the two of you there. The two of us, because Jimby has left to go get water. He asked, who do I think I am? You know, and I could see the anger of, you know, all the times maybe I said no or thought. And for the first time, it clicked to me that something has gone really, really bad. You know, it's not what I, I thought it was. You must have been very afraid. <sighs> you know, I, I thought I was in a movie scene, right? And he said to me, I can get any woman I want, you know? Who do you think you are to reject me? And, and I, I, I was stuttering, I was saying, what, you know what? And, and before I s finished what I was saying, he grabbed me by the arm and pulled me into another room that, had, that was just a door from where we were seated. And just the two of you? And just the two of us still, Jimby hasn't come back yet, you know? 
and in that moment I remember thinking oh I wish she come you know comes back in here and maybe she can stop this or still hasn't clicked that she's part of this and into that room we went and he pulled pushed me shoved me into the chair and locked the door and I started to tell him what are you doing and I started to say that I am sorry, I, I am sorry if I offend you, you know, please don't do this, what's happening. And then he said to me, this could have been way nicer, you know, if you had just accepted, it could have been way better, but it seems like this is how you want it, you know. I remember screaming and pleading and, and, and saying I'm sorry, I wasn't so of what exactly I was sorry about, and he pushed me on my knees he took out his genitals and started rubbing it on my face you know every kind of a derogatory word that you can think of you know he had to use on me you know telling me let's see what's happening you know he he was in his best moment and and and, and in his comfort zone i, I could see and when I was screaming at this point, I was trying to be as loud as I can. He said to me, no one is going to hear you. You know, you can, you can scream all you want. No one is here to hear you. No one is here to save you. He pulled an, um, a, a, a syringe from his pockets and right into uh, my arms right here. You know, the syringe went. It was a smaller syringe. I, I don't know what was in it. He injected me with that. Using force? Of course. I, 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 I'm fighting and pulling back and forth. I think maybe if I wasn't fighting back, he wouldn't need the injection, but he brought it in case I was fighting back. And for me, the, the, the hardest part of my healing throughout these years is I felt like at some point I stopped fighting. And every time I, I remember the fact that I stopped fighting, it broke me and it, it, it you know, it's all the same, all the same comes to me instead that maybe I, I shouldn't have stopped fighting. I don't know why I stopped fighting, pushed me on the bed with my face down, half of my body on the bed, the rest of my legs on the floor, you know. And, and, and now because of the injection or whatever, I, I couldn't feel my, I couldn't hear my screams anymore. It was like I was in a white vacuum. So I, I was screaming, but my ears can't hear my scream. So it was just me opening my mouth again and again. And he, he just wanted to do the most hurtful things, you know. He put me right on my stomach as I was laying down. And when I was laying there, trying to find and grasp my screams and my words all all I could uh, feel was something going up in me you know you know and and and, and yeah I, I, I still feel it you know I, my body and my muscles still feels it and at some point, I, I, I went unconscious, I think, because of whatever was injected in me. Hours later, I, I don't know the time, track time, I woke up from whatever I was in. I, I couldn't find my underwear or my leggings, you know, they, they were missing. Up to this day, I can't find them. And in the couch, facing the bed, is him in his shorts, leaning backwards in the couch. And he told me, get out. And at this point, I, I, there was no tears in my eyes. I was, I was so disoriented. And as soon as I stepped out of the room, there was his bodyguard again with my bag and my phone, who gave me my bag and my phone and told me that this is the president and we will do anything to protect him. Was, was that a threat? <laughs> Was it a, a statement for me to shut up or mm. whatever that was? Mm. And as, as soon as I passed him, there was Jimby, who had disappeared for all this while. And all she said to me was, 
oh, some motor be mong lahar, you know, the car is waiting for you, get in the car. I got into the car, I was in the back seat, drove all the way back to Yundum. You know, the driver didn't say anything to me, I didn't say anything to the driver. I wasn't feeling anything in the moment, it was just like a movie that I have just watched and my memory is trying to to erase it so in, in deliberately in that moment as soon as it happened. The best thing I could I thought I could do for myself was erase it in my head and wipe out like it did not happen. I got home, my mom was asleep, it was late. I called my younger sister and she opened the door and I, I, I went into the to, to the room. And I can remember that same very night as I got into the room. I have already unconsciously made the decision that I'm fine, you know, I, I'm fine. I remember receiving a call from my boyfriend that same night. Hello, oh yeah, hey, oh my, you know, today. Speaking as if, you know, everything was okay, everything was okay but I hung up the phone quickly. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to, to take you back a bit. Um, when he asked you, when you regain consciousness and there was Jame sitting in his suit um, in the room. Apart from asking you to get out, telling you to get out, did he say anything? No. He has said everything he needed to say. He didn't. I, I got home that night. I remember going into the shower, longest shower of my life, like almost two hours or more. I can remember taking the scrub and scrubbing my skin, scrubbing my genitals, somehow wanting to take parts of me off of me because they felt not right on me. They felt like they were not supposed to be part of my body. It was too nasty, too bad, too gross for my body. And I was scraping and my tears were not even rolling. I was, my, my eyes were very dry, you know. I was in such suck and I was, I was doing, I was very convinced that the scrubbing I was doing was really going to scrub everything off, you know? And I would take one position in my hand and I would scrub it and scrub and scrub the life out of it. And next day stayed in, stayed in for almost three days. I would just get out and eat and go back in because I was thinking if anybody had looked at me, they would think, they would see something is wrong with me and I, I didn't want that scene. I and, did you, not and you kept it um, to yourself? To myself. Not even your family? Not even my mother because, you know, what do I tell her? And why am I telling her? She's, she's a mother. If I tell her like any other mother, she's going to be mad. She's going to last house. She's going to speak. I know my mother. She's going to go to the office. She's going to go to wherever she can. But what could she have done at the time if not put me and her in danger? Maybe get herself arrested, lose her job, you know? And, and all I'm doing is just transferring her to her that she cannot do anything about. So I was trying to protect even my loved ones from the hurt and I was thinking I could carry the burden all by myself. So I didn't and I was saying, okay, you don't talk about this, you know, you don't tell anybody about this. You move on with your life, go to school, come back, life goes on, done. You know, he's not even going to contact you again. Maybe, maybe it, it, it was an accident, maybe he, it, it happened and he would not, you know, he's ashamed so he would never reach out again. And actually there was no, was there any other contact either from him directly or from Jimby? But th that is what changed the game for me. That is what changed my life, I would say. Few days after that, we are already in the Ramadan. I received a call from Jimby again, you know? And I remember looking at the phone like, she's not calling me, you know? She's not that wicked, she's not that insensitive to actually call me back. I, I, I think she would have deleted my phone and pretend like she has nothing to do with me or no, no relations to me whatsoever. I picked the call and she said to me, hey, how are you? The normal hey, like nothing has happened, you know, very enthusiastic about it. And she said, oh, this is even happening in two days. Get ready, you'll be coming. I didn't want to tell you last minute. I wanted you to know right now. So 
I remember hanging up that call and saying to myself, oh, this is it, you know? This is not a one-timer. This is, this is something he's gonna keep doing until you regret why you ever said no to him. He's gonna keep calling you, you're gonna get picked up, you're gonna get dropped off, and he's gonna rape you and rape you until it gets to a point that it is no longer rape, you know? And all the dreams I've ever had in whatever, in the kind of a strong woman that I thought I was, or, you know, that I am this girl who's going to change the world and all of that, was just fading away from me. And I said, all I am going to be is a mistress to a president, a sex slave to a president for the rest of God knows when. Mm. I remember clicking that in that moment. Reality hit me hard. And I said to myself that I would rather die, you know. I would rather die. Than and to I, be raped again. Uh, uh, than to be raped again. Let's assume Jamie is watching you right now, is watching this. Right. What do you want to tell him? What, what would you want to tell him? <laughs> that... Mm. This is it, you know? Um, in that moment, uh, in that moment, we, you know, when you, when you did what you did, I was sure that you are sure that you have broken me, you know, into a thousand pieces and, you know, I am no better, of course, you know? I'm so you are convinced of that and I want you to know that I was broken, of course, you know, but I was only broken so I could get the pieces back together, you know, that the girl that you did that to, you know, she, she has become a better person. She has become the person who's looking at you today and narrating the story that you never want to be said, you know? Explaining who you are in your truest forms and in your most unaccountable moments. That you have paved a pathway for me, you know? To come after you, to come after men like you, to, you know, again and again to tell my story as loud and bold and clear as I can, you know? Cause I, I am no longer scared. I am claiming back my power. I am claiming back my space. I am claiming back my story. It is my story. Yeah. Tufa, thank you very much for sharing your story. <sighs> You're I welcome. I wish you peace. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you.